He is being pursued by South Africa's spy agency and its shadowy boss. The South African Revenue Service wants him locked behind bars and he has ruffled the feathers of the country's most powerful man. We're sitting down with, with celebrated investigative journalist and author Jacques Poe to, to talk about the book that has got everybody talking, The President's Keepers, Those Keeping Zuma in Power and Out of Prison. Jacques, thank you very much for joining us here at News24. Pleasure. I think firstly, I'd like to uh, start off by getting some account from you, just um, an indication of what the, the last couple of days have been like since the release of The President's Keepers. It must have been quite a roller coaster ride. Yeah, I mean, I knew before before publication that there there will be a reaction from the from the state enforcement, the law enforcement agencies. Sure. I did expect them to react earlier. I didn't expect state security to take five days to read three or four chapters. Sure. So they were definitely caught asleep. Yeah. Um, we were we were concerned before publication that. If news of the book leaks out, and that's why we couldn't do any any publicity, is that there will be a, an application by one of the law enforcement mm. agencies to ban the book. The problem for them for them now is that they've waited too long. Sure. Um, you know, thousands of books have been sold, and it's it's, you know, the, it's the, the horses bolted argument. Abs absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So uh, so the first few days was was already hectic. And we were selling very well and there was lots of publicity and then came the letter from state security threatening to shut us down and then it yes exploded okay now that the pressure and the backlash is kind of just mounting at that stage can can you give us just a little bit of a summary quickly who's after you and for what reason we know the ssa um would like a cease well, and assist order well the 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 sars says that i have um revealed confidential taxpayers information sure state security say that i've broken the intelligence act by revealing the names of agents and operations and methods and projects and whatever yeah and then up to now there's also a threat from the from the um arthur fraser family Absolutely. who says that i've defamed them and i've made them cr look like criminals and i've alleged that they're 83 year old mother is a uh, is a spy and whatever a spook a paid agent yes and and you are going to maintain throughout that um you've got the goods you've got yes. the evidence you've got the research and you are quite happy for them to to come and yeah and it's, it's you know uh, if you just look at the 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 and it's a long statement by the by the um fraser family hmm. where first of all they allege that i got my information from a former state security agency advocate by the name of Paul Engelke. Sure. Which is not true. It's Absolutely. not where I got the, the reports from. Yes. But anyway, they also call him a Russian double agent. My goodness. Now, I mean, where, where, does, where do they get that? Where do they get the fact? Sure. Paul Engelke is a lecturer at the Moscow State University. Yeah. Um, I don't know where, the, but anyway. And then it's also misleading, you know, that now they say I've said that Mrs. Fraser, who is 83, is a spy. Now, first of all, what I said in my book, and I've got the documentation, is that she was a board member, seven, eight years ago, she was a board member of an organization on the Cape Flats that dealt with violence in schools. Mm. And, that 10 million, and, that she, that, and that she was then registered in the PAN project. Yeah. And that 10 million rand of taxpayers' money um, went to went to her project. It's not as though I say in the book that she had to scrounge the the Cape Flats for terrorists and gangsters and whatever. Absolutely, which just ties into the broader wastage and corruption that you unearthed around the network established by Arthur Fraser earlier. Um, can can you go into a little bit of further detail around the wastage? I mean, there's mention of staggering amounts of money that went into the purchase of cars and and such such wastage. What what actually happened with the Pan Network? Well, the PAN, the, there was nothing, nothing unusual about the, the PAN network. And that's why Ronnie Casserles, who was then the, the intelligence minister, why he approved the principle mm. of the PAN, which stands for Principal Agent Network. Sure. Why he, why he approved the PAN project. Nothing unusual about it. It's simply an expansion of our intelligence capability. So what they did in the end is they appointed... 72 agents hmm. 
For these 72 agents, they bought just less than 300 cars that they stored in three warehouses. Okay. And the Fraser family themselves made money out of the the rental of the of the warehouses. Okay. But it became quite common for for the top structure of Pan that they appointed family and friends. This was a mirror image of what happened at Crime Intelligence under Richard Medluli. Absolutely. Same, same Nepotism, corrupt yeah. networks. So they bought an enormous amount of cars. They imported spy vehicles at an enormous cost from Europe. They hmm. bought houses. And in some cases, they would, bought, they would buy a house and then they would rent it out to themselves again. And the money would be pocketed. Yeah. Now, you must remember this investigation was not just done by by an internal state security investigations team. It was also done by SARS. Oh, yeah. SARS got on board and they started doing lifestyle audits of the different people that were implicated okay. in the fraud and corruption. Probably besides the fact that more or less a billion dollars, a billion, billion dollars, a billion rand um, was thrown at this, at this project. Mm -hmm. Probably the most serious allegation, or probably the two most serious allegations is number one that I said to you, Ronnie Casseroles approved the principal. Sure. They then copied and pasted his signature hmm. on other documents that enabled them to get the money from the financial department. Okay, at, so there's at a further security. element of fraud. Yeah, and I spoke to Ronnie Casseroles last night, in fact, and he said to me he remembers the investigators coming to him hmm. and showing him the different documents. And they said to him, Mr. Castrols, is that your signature? And he said, yes, that's my signature, but it's, I don't know that document. Sure. And he now intends to, to take, to take to, in fact, to lay criminal charges against them yeah. for fraud, corruption, the Intelligence Act, and whatever. So the first was that they, they committed peer fraud by, by, with their copy and paste um, efforts. And then secondly, was that Arthur Fraser had... Um, his own personal server, computer server, installed in his house. Okay. So all the intelligence um, reports from the PAN agents yes. was, were sent to Fraser's personal server. Directly at his private house. So. Yes, and from there he would decide what goes into the okay. into state security. Why, why is that problem problematic? Why is that a risk to, to South Africa's security? And well, the, the investigators found that there seems to have been an attempt by him to establish a parallel intelligence network. Sure. Because they discovered more than 800 documents that he had kept. That he Because what mm. will usually happen is that an agent will send his, his report into the mainframe mm. and from there it will be analyzed and, and action will be sure. decided upon it and whatever. But in this case, he decided what went to the mainframe. And the investigators said it was an effort by him to establish a parallel intelligence network hmm. and that he is probably guilty of treason. Jeez. And do we suspect that and, and, and do you explore uh, the possibility that some of these documents and the parallel intelligence work that, that Frazier has been getting up to, was that politically motivated, uh, some of it? And specifically, was it linked to operations that could have furthered uh, or bolstered the, the position of President Jacob Zuma. You know, there were, and I, I, I also spoke to agents who were part of the net, part of the network. There's reports, there's the SARS reports, and then I, I spoke to agents who were in the pair network, and they said to me there was they are convinced that there was an that this was part of an effort to make the Western Cape ANC again. Hmm. And that they were definitely efforts to to boost the ANC in the Western Cape. They didn't have any substantial proofs. So I didn't write it, but there were definitely allegations that was, this was politically motivated sure. as well. Shock. Um, globally, I think the uh, the workings of intelligence, you know, of a country's intelligence apparatus, that by definition and and to a large extent probably justifiably is supposed to be rather clandestine or secretive. You know, the the broader public for justifiable reasons sometimes is not supposed to know yeah. the nitty gritty of all the dealings. Why, why is it important for you to expose um, some of these issues that, that now uh, appear to be not, you know, kind of uh, to be checked by the justifiable box and, you know? Well, I, th I think first of all, we can't allow the, the intelligence services. And let's just talk here 
uh, about crime intelligence, police crime mm. intelligence, and state security. Both of them have secret projects sure. and secret funds, which is not audited by the Auditor General. Mm. It's obviously a massive flaw in our in our um, intelligence setup, is that you and I are not supposed to know what state security's budget is every year. We're not supposed to know how many people work at mm. state security. You can't ask those questions, you will never get an answer. And I think with fraud and corruption being, being so rife at the moment, mm. we have to, there has to, we have to change the Intelligence Act, for example, to enable the relevant authorities to inspect and to check what is going on at state security. At Crime Intelligence, their secret fund is around 600 million rand a year. Mm. State security is much bigger. Mm. But at, at, at Crime Intelligence, for example, we can see how we all know that crime is rising. Mm. There's an increase in murder. There's an increase in, in heists and whatever. What is Crime Intelligence doing? Mm. If they're doing their job, and there's, there's thousands of people sitting at Crime Intelligence, if they're doing their job, the crime rate, would, the crime rate wouldn't be this high. Yeah. When is the last time you've heard of a major bust of a criminal syndicate? It doesn't happen anymore. So what are they doing with their money? Absolutely. Where, where's their money going? Buying flashy cars and nice houses and living it up large. Absolutely. So I think then, then basically what you're saying is that the argument of there is that, you know, that they, they are allowed to run these secret projects and that we shouldn't be privy to those details. That falls away when there are clear indications of corruption and fraud and, and basically... Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I don't, I don't think that state security can now um, hold the Intelligence Act and accuse me of breaking the Intelligence Act. They are hiding behind the Intelligence Act to hide their crimes. Mm, no, absolutely. You know, I, th I think, I mean, there's this, this classical saying, and it was said by Edward Snowden, the American whistleblower, who said, when exposing a crime is treated like a crime, it means that we are being ruled by criminals. And sure. this is what we're seeing in, in, in this case. Is, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to help to shoot the messenger. Mm. Go and look at the allegations and deal with it. Yes, yes. No. And there's a role to be played by, you know, government bodies such as the IGI, the Inspector General of Intelligence. Mm. There's a, supposed to be a well-functioning and independent parliamentary oversight body that mm. also probes the, the doings of the, the intelligence structures. Why, why aren't they effective in South Africa? Well, uh, you know, and I deal, I deal with the, the IGI, the Inspector General of Intelligence, in quite detail in the book. And they've been toothless for a long, long time now. Mm. Whereby, you know, I think the last time a report was released by the um, Inspector General of Intelligence was around the Billy Masetla case, which was mm, when, many years ago, you know, like 2007, mm. around there. Since then, no report of the Inspector General has ever been released. Mm. We don't know what the IG, IGI investigate. We don't know the outcome of investigations. And one again, once again, you don't expect them to reveal state secrets, mm, but mm. we have to know that the IGI is effective. Now, I know for a fact when the IGI was, and it was then um, um, Faith Khadebe was the Inspector General mm. when, when the crime and corruption was going on at State Intelligence. I know for a fact that, that the IGI never, for example, even interrogated the documentation and the evidence. Mm. And it was a, yet it took three years for the IGI investigation. Sure. Less than between mm. two and three years for the IGI to release a report. We don't know what stands in the report. Mm. The Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence can't get a copy of the report either. Mm. They mm. were just told that, you know, there were a few problems, but everything is now kind of okay and whatever. So, also as far as the IGI is concerned, we need to know what the IGI is doing. You know, the IGI was, was for almost two years the IGI was complete, completely dysfunctional. Mm. There wasn't an IGI. Mm. Before Dintwe's appointment. Yes, recently, when yeah. we, after Khadebe left. There yeah. wasn't even an IGI. Mm. Go and look at their website. Their website still is 
hasn't been updated for a very, very long time. Sure. There's so obviously very little going on, on there. And what we have in this case, for example, when SAR started investigating 10 or 12 top people of the PAN project, it was the IGI. Mm, uh, mm. It was advocate governor of the IGI that went to SARS and stopped the SARS investigation and said to SARS, mm. don't worry, we're dealing with all of this. You have to close your investigations, which they did. And it, it seemed to be quite a dubious plea on her side because Absolutely. ultimately nothing ever came of the, of the probes. Yeah. yeah, ultimately never. So on the no. whole, you said a desperate need of some transparency and oversight in South Africa when it comes to the workings of these shady intelligence yeah, if you, if you look, if you look at Yeah, if you look at the, the role of the IGI and the Oversight Committee, hmm. on paper it looks beautiful. Sure. But it's once again the people that that you have in, in power. Yeah. When Cecil Burgess, for example, was the chairperson of the, of the Oversight Committee, mm. they hardly ever met. Jeez. Well, Jacques, you, you also, obviously, you know, you spend a great deal of time um, in the book, or a, a great deal of, you know, um, of the, the, the chapters deal with these kind of shady dealings, the spooks and spies that, that assist Jacob Zuma in keeping out of trouble, you know, mm. and staying out of, uh, out of jail and you know, uh, getting to his enemies and such. Um, does it surprise you if you kind of consider Jacob Zuma's background, you know, where he comes from, he used to be the ANC's intelligence head back mm. in the, the pre-94 disposition. Should we be, be surprised, I suppose, that, that Jacob Zuma is conducting himself as somewhat of a spy master, that the real uh, puller of strings behind the scenes of all these intelligence projects? Ab absolutely not. And I think Jacob Jacob Zuma's brutality also tells you where he where he where he comes from, and his uh, as far as his 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 role as an intelligence master is concerned, he is masterful. Mm. And if we look at the way he's captured the law enforcement agencies, state security, SARS, crime intelligence, the Hawks, NPA, all of them, how he's captured them. It was quite a masterful process because in order to capture all these institutions, he had to get rid of very credible people like Gibson Jenje and Mo Sheikh and Anwar Dramat at the, at the Hawks and yeah. Shadrach Sabia and Johan Boysen in KwaZulu Natal and mm. Ivan Pillay and Johan van Lochrenberg and people like that. He had to get rid of all of them to place his own cronies in, in place, which he has mm. done. Sure. He succeeded. Zuma the chess player in action. Absolutely. I mean, it took him, took him a few years. Yeah. But there he is now. And we've seen it with, with all the work you and others have done about the Gupta emails, for example. Mm. Uh, all the allegations around the, the, the fraud and corruption of the Gupta family. Nothing has ever happened. Yeah. If you think about the public protector's state, state of capture report. Sure. Where's the investigations that were supposed to... Yeah. flow from there. Absolute paralysis in those sectors right paralysis. now. I mean, this, just this morning we learned that uh, Khomotsa Pashlani, previous acting police commissioner, yeah. uh, uh, will not be prosecuted by the, the NPA for his very apparent, yeah. you know, yeah, corrupt yeah, yeah. dealings with suppliers to the SAPs. Absolutely. So that kind of ties into the his broader paralysis system that you, that you and cars and whatever. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Bags, absolutely. Of, bags of money. Yeah. Not, not surprising. <laughs> yeah. Jock, we've, we've spoken t um, about some of the, you know, some of the fallout, I suppose, of the, 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 the fight back by the likes of the SSA and SARS following the publication of your book. Um, but I suppose a even more ominous um, kind of fallout now has come in the form of death threats that we've, we've heard about. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. You know, I th I'm, I'm still not sure. It's quite, mm. it's quite unnerving, but I'm not, I'm not sure how seriously mm. I, I take them because I've had death threats before. Sure. And I've always said if somebody wants to kill you, he's not going to warn you that he's going to kill you. Yeah. Um, but I, it's, it's clear that people are angry. You yeah. could hear it. I got two, two phone calls over the weekend. Um, and it was it was definitely from from Cape gangsters. I mean, they were talking Afrikaans and mm. they were um, they were talking Cape Afrikaans and they was also speaking Afrikaans. So it definitely came from those quarters. Sure. And then I had one last night. You know, in fact, while I was speaking to Ronnie Casseroles, mm. I could see there was sort of like private number, private number, trying to get through. And I thought it was the lawyers or something at some point. 
And I said to Ronnie, I'll call you back. And when I took it with somebody who said to me, if you continue writing about Jacob Zuma, we're going to kill you. Unbelievable. Now, I mean, yeah. you know, what, what, is, what do I give it to Arthur Fraser to investigate? Yeah, or the Hawks or the yeah, police I mean, or, you know, yeah, who's left. Yeah. Absolutely. No, sure. Jock, that, that's kind of the, the one side of the coin. Um, but I suppose a more encouraging and positive aspect, um, you know, from, from uh, what we've seen in the last couple of days following the publication of the book, it's this massive, you know, uh, support um, mm. f throughout the country that's, that's streamed in. Have you, have you found that to be very encouraging? And yeah, you know, I've, I've always said that Jacob Zuma has brought us to the brink of a gangster state. If we haven't, it, we might even have entered the first, the first little bit of a gangster state. But we, we definitely, we're in the realm of a, of a gangster state. And I've always said there's only three things that can save us from becoming a failed democracy mm -hmm. and a state run by, by criminals. And that is, number one, the courts. And they have been magnificent. Mm. There's secondly, the media. And in the past, especially, say, in the past two years, the media has been fantastic. And the third pillar is, is civil society, mm. who's also been reacting wonderfully. Yeah. And it's, it, in the end, it's going to be up to, to people like me and others to, to not to sit back and just to accept Mm. That we that the, we 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 sliding into into an abyss. That we have we have to do our bit, and I think everybody has to do his bit. And I think this is what this book has done: was sort of like mobilize people against something that they absolutely fed up with. Mm. We've had enough of crime. We've had enough of corrupt, corruption, yes. and nothing is happening. We've just mm. spoken about this. Crime is rising. SARS just said that they're going to have a 50 billion rand shortfall this year. They had 30 billion rand last year. Mm. People are hot full of this. They want mm. to see something happening. Yes, and especially I think, you know, this makes the, the work that uh, journalists such as yourselves and other journalists do even more important because we can, we can show members of the public that whilst there's a SARS uh, backlog or a mm. shortfall in, their, in their, their revenue that they generate, individuals such, such as President Jacob Zuma is not properly taxed. Mm. for the, the side incomes that he generates all over the place. Yeah. So do you, do you think that's important for us to, to kind of keep on showing the people the, or the, the populace the nitty gritty of corruption so that they can actually yeah, see I th how I, th I, th I think on the one hand people do get tired of too much exposés and mm. too, much, too much corruption. Corruption fatigue. For corruption fatigue. And we saw it with the Gupta emails. Mm. Is that after a while, and I've, I'm taking even myself, would read sort of the first four or five paragraphs. Mm. Um, so I think people, people do get tired. And there is also probably a sense amongst people of, we can't do anything to stop this. Let's, you know, in the little village where I come from, people live in paradise. I mean, they're hardly mm. aware of what's going on. It's a bit of a bubble. It's a bit of a bubble. But I think, I think we, you know, we have to do our bit. People have to stand up and they have to support the right party and the right candidates and the right mm. causes. Sure, sure. Jacques, so uh, you've been doing your bit for, for quite a couple of years already, quite a couple of decades in fact. I think there are many um, younger South Africans who, who probably wouldn't uh, remember some of the earlier work you did, very important work on going back to the 80s, you know, the uncovering of a, a death squad at Flakplas and mm. there could see and the role played by the, the South African security police back in the day in terrible atrocities mm -hmm. committed in the name of the apartheid government. Um, having been closely involved with the, the un uncovering of those kind of transgressions back in the day, um, can you draw personally for yourself, have you drawn parallels in the way that the current security establishment is now conducting itself? Has, has anything changed or has it been much of the same? No, I've, you know, we, we still have a beautiful constitution. We've got freedom of speech which we didn't have back in the, back in the apartheid years. Mm. But I think the behavior of our law enforcement agencies are becoming more and more reminiscent of what it was during the apartheid years. The mere fact that the state wants to ban a book. I'm not jeopardizing any, any operations or any projects or any agents or anything like this. Mm. Um, they simply want to ban a book because it is embarrassing for them. And once again, we have to be very, very careful that we don't slide back into that abyss that we, that we came from. 
you know, and, and, and you know, in Ronnie Casserell says it beautif beautifully in his book, for example, of, um, for God's sake, let's not go back from where we were. Mm. And it's going to take an effort from all of us to prevent that from happening. Yeah, no, no, no absolutely. And obviously you, you've, you've been involved uh, first and uh, I suppose in the day of the Freie Wirkblatt. You know, mm. you guys have experienced <coughs> first and what it feels like to be gagged and to be suppressed by government. Mm. Is, is there a sense of disappointment, I suppose, you know, having lived through all of that and then having also gone through, you know, the, the to a large extent, promising era of 1994 and what the future would hold and a, a strong constitutional democracy and one mm. where the freedom of the press would be would be guaranteed. Is it is it disappointing to someone such as yourself who's now kind of experiencing again the same, you know, the, the threat of being gagged or, and of the... Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I took up the pen <coughs> again. Mm. You know, when I, when I wrote this book, Max de Priem said to me, okay, he said to me, you're now going to do your national service for the third time. <laughs> I did my national service as a young white man who had to go to the army. I did my national service at Freie Wirkblatt. And he said to me, now you have to do your national service again. And I think this is, this is what the current government is doing to us, hmm. is we suddenly, um, people like myself who come from that era, suddenly we scared that we know how bad it can be. Hmm. Um, you know, can you, for example, imagine that we, we clinch a nuclear deal of a trillion rand? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the other day when I when I had to write a trillion. I had to look on the internet how many noughts yeah. I have to put on. I a think thousand it's 12. Billion. Yes, yeah, 12 it's zeros. 12 yeah. zeros. That's how much a trillion is. You know, not too long ago we were still talking about millions. And then it, now it's billions. It might become trillions. Now can you imagine mm. that we enter the nuclear deal and we can't pay social welfare grants anymore. Mm. Mm. And there's not enough money to, to armor the police and build schools and build hospitals. Can you imagine what can happen with this country? We can mm. have civil unrest. Absolute with uproar this, with and this, revolt. With, a, yeah. with the state clamping down. And yet it seems as though our Minister of Finance, who's a bit of a Zuma stooge, we all know that, mm. even he said there's no money for, for nuclear. He's seen the coffers and now he's realized that there's not enough money. There's not yeah. enough money. And it seems as though Zuma lives in a universal, in a, in a, in a parallel universe. Yes. And he's not aware of what is going on him, yes. around him. I mean, he obviously doesn't know what a trillion is. Absolutely. And Jock, I mean, he's acting like a man to a large extent who seems to be beholden to outside interests. Yes. Um, if you um, talk about the, the proposed nuclear expenditure, we tie that back to the Russians. Yeah. Um, but in more specific detail, you've written about financial contributions that have been made to President Jacob Zuma by other business people, specifically South African business people. And one of those that, that really caught the headlines was a, uh, a nice little side salary of one million rand a month that came from an in individual called Roy Moodley, mm. who's a Durban-based businessman. W why would that be problematic? Why, why shouldn't Jacob Zuma uh, get some sort of a side benefit, just for the layman? Well, he was paid, he was paid the million rand salary a month for a year before becoming president and for at least tw four months after he became president in May 2009. Now you can't have a president on a payroll. Mm. You can't have a president who's an employee of someone else. And that's probably why when Roy Moodley, and lots have been written about, you've written about mm. Roy Moodley lately, when Roy Moodley had his 50th birthday celebration in the, in the International Conven Convention Center in Durban, his son made a speech while Zuma was sitting there as the guest of honor. And his son said, and he, he pointed to his father and he said, he's the most powerful man in the country. Mm. Now we know why his son had said that. Mm, mm. Um, you know, Pierre de Force wrote about this the other day, and it's a complete breach of the Constitution, and there might even be criminal intent in all of this. Sure, but we shouldn't be holding up their uh, breaths for no, anybody nothing, in the law no, enforcement side nothing, to actually pursue nothing, one of Nothing will happen. You know, I've, I've mm. always said to people, it's not going to be parliament. It's mm. not going to be journalists. It's certainly not going to be a book yeah. that leads to Jacob Zuma's downfall. Sure. The only body that can remove him is the NEC of the ANC, and he employs half of them. Yeah. Jock, it's, it's going back to the, the, the payments and sort of the money trail. You know, it's a... 
a tax implication and the involvement of uh, officials at the South African Revenue Service um, and their um, probes of tax related affairs of individuals close to President Jacob Zuma mm. and President Jacob Zuma himself <coughs> that that seemed to have played a role in a massive um, you know uh, dramas and uh, the undoing to a large extent of the South African Revenue Service and its capacity to in yeah. in investigate tax related offences. Absolutely. Do you believe what we saw back in, in 2014, 2015 was the fallout of these tax officials going after the likes of Zuma and his friends? Yeah, and, and I think we must quickly talk about two SARS regimes here. The one SARS regime was up to 2014 and that was the SARS of Opa Magashule and Praveen Gordon and mm. Um, ultimately uh, Ivan Pele up to the end of 2014 and then the second SARS regime when Tom Wayani took over at the end of 2014 and the first SARS regime um, was prepared to treat every taxpayer in exactly the same manner sure. whether he was just a man man on the street or whether it was the president and that message was relayed to Zuma in a meeting in February 2014 he had with Ivan Pele when SARS was begging him to file his tax returns which he hadn't done for five, the first five years of his presidency. Pele, Pele pleaded with Zuma mm. to submit his tax returns and he then said to Zuma if you don't return it we will have no other option but to treat you as just another taxpayer. Absolutely. And less than a year later, the top structure of SARS was gone. The investigative units were gone. Mm. And, uh, and Tom Oyani and his cronies took over. And SARS today is very much a broken institution. Sure. Jock, I think very importantly, too, in that broader narrative is the fact that, or, or to highlight the fact that the media played a very significant role in making sure that these troublemakers at SARS uh, were, were booted out of the, the tax man. Uh, we're thinking of specifically a series of rogue unit reports yeah. uh, that were carried it's, by it's a pro prominent it's South, South African Sunday newspaper. Do, do by you the think Sunday Times. I mean, by the we Sunday all know Times. Them. But it's, it's probably the lowest point in South African newspaper so history. So do you believe the media actively played a role in this Grand plot to yeah. ensure that these well, individuals you know, were ousted. When two weeks after Moyani arrived at at SARS. Now you must remember in the in the in the preceding six to eight months before Moyani arrived, Van Lochrenberg was already removed by by basically a state security campaign against him when he had a relationship with a state security and he's not innocent here when he had a relationship with a state security agent who's also an attorney. Belinda Walters. Belinda Walter. And she then sort of like, he fell into a honey mm -hmm. trap and he was basically then suspended. Then Moyani and then Ivan Pele was also suspended. And then came in Moyani and two weeks after Moyani arrived at SARS, suddenly the SARS, the SARS rogue unit um, reportage started in the, mm -hmm. in the Sunday Times, where weak after week after week, I think there were altogether 26 articles, very prominent, but many of them were, were the headline news. Um, week after week where, where, where they wrote about the fact that SARS ran a brothel, for example, mm. without any evidence, that SARS, that SARS spy, spied on Zuma. Mm. Articles like that, week after week after week. And I remember, for example, the day after they published the, the, the SARS um, brothel story, mm. Tom Oyani said that he cannot allow this to go on anymore. Mm. And he suspended even more, more of the executives. So he was and Sunday Times was instrumental in the removal mm. of the top structure of SARS. We all know today that the stories were nonsense. Yeah. There was a subsequent KPMG investigation mm. that has been withdrawn. The press ombudsman has ruled that the, yes, the articles were Yes, and the Sunday with Times faces. ultimately apologized. Sure. The editor left. Mm. Some of the journalists left. 
Um, but so only after the damage really had yeah, been the done. Yeah, the damage had been, had been done there. Yeah. And it was a very, very sad day for, for South African journalists. Yes, but especially if you consider the fact, Jacques, that um, that is not an isolated incident. And it's not one that stopped in 2014, 15, mm. 16. I'm mean, uh, thinking back recently this year, we've seen reports on supposed emails deta detailing an affair that um, Deputy yeah. President yeah. Cyril Ramaphosa um, supposedly had. There was a, a series of reports on a supposed intelligence project called Operation Wonder yeah. that was also very effectively used to make sure that people were booted out of crime intelligence and so on and so on. How, how do we as the media, I suppose, and as authors and research, researchers guard against becoming these very useful tools in the hands of some very nefarious individuals in, in well, the intelligence well, I community? Think, I think journalists must first of all realize that politicians, or many politicians, not all politicians, that many politicians are nothing but prostitutes in drag. <laughs> and that we should be very wary what we get from them mm. and what they feed us. And we should be very wary of their cronies. But I think it's also up to readers. You know, readers must be very careful what they read and mm. what they believe. You know, when, when I just look at, at Facebook, for example, you often get these posts that people post and it, sometimes it, they genuinely believe it's true which is just completely fake news and I think and I think we might see even more of it with a run-up to the to the ANC conference in December but I mm. think I think the readers and the and the viewers and the people who who do social social media must be very very careful what they believe and what they read and what they repost and send on and what they believe. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, having mentioned, you know, the December elective conference um, and the, the obviously the, the, the bitter, bitter rivalries we're going to see playing out now in the lead up to that, should we anticipate even further abuses of these kind of in nefarious intelligence operatives and, and such, you know, in, in order to further the cause of, of some of these individuals who are now running for the top positions that in the ANC? Absolutely. You know, we've seen, we've seen lately We've seen um, very mysterious break-ins, for example, in the offices of the Chief Justice and the NPA and places mm. like that. Um, we have these secret funds in the law enforcement agencies. We don't know where that money is going to mm. or what that money has been used for. You know, with the last, the, the last elective conference in 2012, Yep. Yes, in 2012, in Bloemfontein, in, yeah. in Mango Home. A very notorious bunch of crime intelligence officers went to Mango Home with enormous amounts of money. Mm. Why? To, to do buy what? votes. To buy votes. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and we, we all know, and it's, you know, it's public knowledge, that Jacob Zuma has his preferred candidate, his ex-wife, and, and, and that's why I believe it will be very, very difficult to beat her. Because of the support she's getting from, from law enforcement agencies, sure. she's already treated like a VIP with a blue light brigade and whatever. So very ominous sounding. So journalists yeah. on the ground in the summer should should keep a watchful eye for, yeah, for these absolutely. kind of dealings. Jacques, at the at the rate the book is flying off the shelves, I almost I don't actually have to ask this question. Um, pretty soon, every South African would have read the book. It seems at this rate. But um, if there's one thing that you would like all South Africans to know that that um, that you've unearthed in the book or that you've written about. But what would that what what would that one thing be? That we are just about a gangster state. And please, let's try and stop it and not go there. Great, great words there. Uh, this is uh, Jacques Poe's book, uh, The President's Keepers. As I've said, um, I think you'd pretty much have to rush to the nearest bookstore to get a copy. They flying off the shelves. I understand more, are more copies are on the way. They I think it's was available he restocking? tomorrow. It's still available tomorrow. So, Jacques, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Pleasure. It was Thank very, you very, very informative. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure.